Jacob Evans was born and raised in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, taught to love uh, and serve God in the Pulaski Street Church of Christ. He's a three-time graduate of Fried Hartman University, earning a Bachelor of Arts with a double major in Bible and English, 2002, a Master of Ministry degree in 2007, and a Master of Divinity in 2013. In 2006, Jacob was instrumental in planning the Greenback Congregation in Greenback, Tennessee, and served as a preacher for this congregation until March of 2015. And we're still able, our students are still able to go and, and, and preach there, and we're thankful for that good church. Um, from 2013 to 15, he also served as Dean of Academics and instructor here at Southeast. We appreciate his service to the, the school here. But in 2015 in April, he was able to go back and had the privilege of returning home and preaching for the congregation there at Pulaski Street. Still serves the, the good people there, the congregation at Pulaski Street. He's married to Brittany Ringgold of Chattanooga. They have one daughter, Reese, who's nine, two sons, Chapman, seven, and Ford, three years old. Um, he loves his family, he loves the church, and he loves the work. And he's been given a very simple <laughs> topic. Who is Jesus of Nazareth? He had 45 minutes to tell us all about him. Uh, we're thankful that you're here and look forward to your lesson. Yeah, the topic... It's kind of like how John's gospel is described. It is, uh, I think, I think Brother Leip tracked it down, but, um, and I can't recall exactly, I think it was Augustine maybe that said, well, the gospel of John is like, uh, it's, it's shallow enough for a child to wade, but it's deep enough for like a elephant to swim, right? And this topic, who is Jesus of Nazareth? There's a simplicity to it that's just fantastic. But there's depths here we will never plummet. At least not on this side of things. Um, I want to start uh, by just thanking you all for being here. And I'm, I, I, I've heard some incredible lessons. I mean, it far exceeds whatever expectations you have when you're a lectureship committee and you're sitting around thinking about, hey, let's just map this out. Let's find some guys, some preachers, and let's make this happen. And, you know, you get to the end of this. We've got one more lesson later. And you hear all that's been preached, and you got to start wondering why, one, why would anyone not want to follow Jesus? Uh, why, I mean, if, if I'm given a chance, I want Jesus to be who he is. I don't want Jesus to be who he says he is. I would, I kind of like who he says he is and what he offers, right? Uh, and so there's, it's interesting how the world, Satan, things blind people to something that is so obviously incredible and good. So I'm going to start a little silly and get serious. Um, one of the things that I really like to do, I hadn't got to do as much during this pandemic, but I like to go to a good movie and I like to get a small to medium popcorn and I like to put into my popcorn milk duds. I absolutely love milk duds. In fact, I recently did a funeral for a lady and I am interviewing at the visitation, one of her childhood friends. And she said, when we were growing up, one of her favorite things to do was to go to the movie theater and get a popcorn and milk duds. And I knew at that moment, I love this lady, right? There's another candy that I despise with every fiber of my being, Whoppers. I hate Whoppers. If you like Whoppers, I will try to like you. Right? I don't like Whoppers. If I, if I were to misidentify a Whopper as a milk dud, that would be a problem for me, right? I'm thinking I'm about to eat a milk dud, but I'm eating a Whopper. That misidentification might be a, you know, a little, 
a little tough. I could, I could eat another different candy, maybe drink some milk, and we could handle that misidentification pretty quickly. Um, things get a little bit more complicated, for instance, if you misidentify me as the man who just robbed the bank down the road, right? That's a problem. You're thinking, I'm the guy that just did that. We've got an issue, right? But what if, what if a person misidentified Jesus of Nazareth? What if a person mistook Jesus of Nazareth for just a mere man who had a knack for saying thought-provoking things. That's who he is. That's, the, that's kind of the extent of it. What if, a, what if that is what you come to sort of associate with Jesus? That's, that's how you identify him. Nothing more. A few things. In fact, the more, the more we've gone through this week, I'm almost ready to drop a few things and go, perhaps nothing is more important in this life than correctly identifying Jesus of Nazareth. What we think about Jesus of Nazareth could not be more important. It is, in fact, in part, the difference between heaven and hell. And that's, so we started kind of silly the things just got serious. Um, by the way, for all the preachers, this is a lectureship on the Gospel of John. So you, obviously that's what we're going to kind of do to frame this lesson and move through it. But another great launching, uh, launching pad for this lesson, you could go to Matthew 16 or you could go over to Luke 9. And remember Jesus is sort of taking a, a poll of the crowds. What it, what are all these people saying about me? Remember that? What are people saying? And people are offering up, well, yeah, they think you're Jeremiah. You're one of the prophets, Elijah, something like this. Um, so you could start there with this lesson and, and uh, do a fantastic job. But we'll, we're going to use the Gospel of John. Um, and, and it's clear from just a perusal of the Gospel of John that People had different thoughts about Jesus of Nazareth in the first century. Now, there are what we might consider to be a couple of bookends in the Gospel of John, where we have an individual that says something about who Jesus is, that identifies Jesus in some way, okay? The first bookend I put at um, John chapter 1 here is where uh, Philip, he, he's, he's come to see that Jesus is certainly special, uh, even, in fact, the Messiah. And so he comes to Nathaniel and he's like, hey, listen, Jesus of Nazareth, this, this is the Messiah. This is the one we've been waiting for. You got to love uh, Nathaniel's response. I mean, Nathaniel hears Jesus of Nazareth and that, that's that word Nazareth he gets hung up on. He, you know, this is um, a town, a city that, um, I mean, there weren't a lot of accolades for this city. It was, it was kind of a, a, a no-name town. And he had a hard time sort of bringing together the possible origin of the Messiah. It just didn't, it didn't fit what he would have thought to be the case about, you know, the origin of Jesus. I mean, here is a, a place which folks viewed with disdain. It wasn't a place that was worthy, right, of being associated with someone like the Messiah. But then after an interesting exchange here are the words of Nathaniel. Rabbi, teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. 
The other, I kind of have the other book in, in John 20. I think you know the context of this statement. Thomas is flailing a bit. His master, um, his, his teacher has been laid in the tomb along with probably all of his hopes and aspirations at that time. And then his fellow apostles, disciples come to him and say, he's alive. And Thomas is incredulous and even demands tactile proof. I want, I want to actually touch. I want to see these wounds and I want to touch these wounds. And, and Jesus gives him just what he asked for. And we don't really have any indication in the text that, that Thomas actually did touch him. He might, might have, but this is what he says. He says, my Lord and my God. Now between those bookends, I think we've, we know this. If you've been here this week, you know what John's gospel's about. It's about Jesus. And it's about properly identifying him, seeing him for who he is, and believing in him for who he is. He is Jesus who is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And between these bookends and around these bookends, here is, um, I don't think this is quite exhaustive, but this gives you an indication of what various folks, including Jesus himself, this is various identifiers that are attached to Jesus. Now, we've been doing some of the I am statements. I just had a great one from, from Brother Cochran on I am the true vine. And these are all identified. I am this. So he is identifying himself as this. Now, as you look down that list, some of these, you're like, yes, yes, that's, that's wonderful. That's great. A few of these might disturb you a little bit, Right? In the Gospel of John, Jesus is kind of like on trial. And as a reader, you got to figure out who you're going to side with. Are you going to side with the claims that Jesus is making about himself and those that are coming to see him for his? Or are you going to side with many of the Jews who would say things like, I know, I know who you are. You are a Samaritan. Let me just tell you, they were not trying to endear themselves to him when they called him a Samaritan. And, and meant, imagine the audacity of somebody looking at Jesus and saying, I got this figured out. I, you are a demon-possessed man. That's what you are. That's who you are. You are possessed by a demon. And so you see one person, <laughs> you ready for this? I know who you are. You're a sinner. So you, you, have, you have some of these identifications are falling from the lips of Jesus himself. He's got his self-claims. Others of these were spoken by people whose faith or understanding of Jesus sort of progressed in their interaction with him. They, one of the best ones is John 9. You know, the man born blind, at the start of that chapter, he is a man. At the end of that chapter, he's not a man, just a man. He is Lord. Others were voiced by people who were either ignorantly or willfully opposed to him. And many Jews dismissed or doubted the identity of Jesus on the basis, you ready for this? His earthly parentage. There's that passage in John 6, 42. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? I get this. You want to know, why weren't Jesus's brothers believing in him at first? Here's what it comes down to. I grew up with him, right? That is... He is my half brother. I, you know, I, I, that'd be an interesting conversation to have, right, with the kids. Like, well, Jesus, yeah, he's interesting. But they, they grew up with Jesus, and it, and people are like, I know his daddy. I think I know his. I mean, you're telling me that he is this? They were incredulous. 
Another, another reason why people didn't identify him like they should have was his alleged Sabbath breaches, right? I mean, if there was one thing Jesus was good at, it was coloring outside the lines of the Pharisees. I do believe that he deliberately chose to heal the lame man on a Sabbath day. I do believe that. I mean, the man's been laying there 38 years. What's one more, what's, what's one more day, right? It's a Sabbath day. Jesus, you probably could circumvent some problems here. Just wait a day. No, we're going to do this today. And he had good reasons for And he could have probably, it probably been good if he said, don't pick up your mat and walk, right? What did he say? Pick up your mat and walk. What's he doing? He's, here's what they, this is the circle they drew. And he gets the crayon and just starts coloring out here, you know. And they're like, you can't do that. You're a sinner, right? You're not the son, you're not the Messiah. Some of the other things are perceived blasphemies. Um, you know, like you got to love John 5, 17 and 16, 17 and 18. On one hand, they go, this is why the Jews were seeking to kill him. John tells us because he was breaking the Sabbath. In the next breath, another reason they're trying to kill him is because he's claiming to be God. He's making himself equal with God. And they're like, you can't do that. that that's ridiculous. You, you, there's no way that you are who you claim to be. And then I think some folks dismissed Jesus, didn't see him for who he was because of misinformation. Uh, John 7, it's a great chapter. They're having conversations about Jesus. Is this the Christ? I, folks were like, it's, I mean, who else could it? It's got to be. Uh, but but the, the, the religious leaders are like, hey, Hey, there's, there's no prophet Messiah coming from, from Galilee. He's supposed to come from Bethlehem. Misinformation. They did not quite understand his origin story, right? He did come from Bethlehem, but ended up pretty quickly in Nazareth, right? So misinformation tripped up some people. Um, facts are like kind of important, Right? As much as people don't like facts or whatever, try to dismiss them, facts are really important. And this is true in coming to a correct understanding of who Jesus is. So John, look at this. It's like, we're going to put Jesus on center stage. And around every corner, almost every chapter, you are going to be confronted with who is Jesus of Nazareth. For John, Jesus proved his supernatural identity through his supernatural signs. That's John 20, 30, and 31. Hey, I've recorded all of these signs because here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at the signs and I want you to go, this is who he is. This is what he did, so this is who he is. It just has to, go, this, is, this is how this works. His works are going to validate his words. So if he's doing this kind of stuff and he's saying this kind of stuff, then what he's doing over here is going to validate what he's saying over here. Now, while Jesus does have people today, like you in here, that see him for who he is, that love him for who he is, that follow him for who he is, one of the more heartbreaking things that we have to admit to ourselves is that the majority of people in this world have not yet seen him for who he is. And so people have thoughts about him, right? And I just want to share with a few of these with you of what people are saying about Jesus today, okay? And then maybe in some cases, we got people who for one reason or another, Maybe don't want Jesus to be who he claimed to be. Right? They got a reason for that. And so they got to come up with something, right? So here you go. Um, he was a mythic, legendary figure, right? Uh, there might have been, if he didn't, you know, some people are willing to try to argue that he didn't exist at all. That he is just a mythological character, period. Some people think, no, he, there was a guy that maybe came from Nazareth, but there's just been all this 
strata. You know, there's just all these layers of stuff that's cropped up on top of him, you know. This isn't a sensible view to hold. Never underestimate the power of the four gospels. We got, we got two eyewitness accounts from these gospels and we have two gospels that are essentially based on direct testimony all of them written within about 60 years of Jesus's life it's pretty remarkable especially when you take into account that we're dealing with a very oral society in the first century they get all this stuff written down and codified as it were right and if you study them for their historical reliability. Honest, balanced, objective historians will tell you these things do not read like myths and legends and fables. They, and they do some weird stuff like having women being the first witnesses to the empty tomb. That is not what they would have done if they were trying to establish some sort of legendary thing, you know. I mean, guys, we we have more we have we have more evidence, historical evidence, to prove that Jesus was an historical personage than we do for Julius Caesar. And nobody questions the historicity of Julius Caesar. And we even have hostile testimony. We have like Tacitus, a Roman historian, and others who verify. The historical reality, not of just Jesus' life, but also even his death, a specific time period under a guy named Pilate. This is not, this is not a sensible view to hold, but some will hold to that. Here's probably the most popular view, so we're going to spend just a little time on this. Some would say he was an exceptionally bright Jewish rabbi. Uh, he was a great moral teacher and philosopher. And as you're going to see, this is in some ways very patronizing to Christians. And I want to want to demonstrate what I mean by that. Um, based on a perusal of the Gospels, you do Matthew, you go through Mark, and you go through Luke, and you go through John... I think all of us would agree or anybody reading the gospels would agree that Jesus taught on morality and ethics. He, he talked to people about what they said. He talked to people about what they did. He talked to people even about what, how they thought. So he had a lot to say about, about morality. But this, this right here is very, very important. He didn't just preach on morality. Jesus made the most jaw-dropping self-claims of anybody anywhere, especially in that historical context. So, for instance, and these have been mentioned at various points along the way, it, I think showing the impact of these statements on preachers. He made this statement right in John 8, before Abraham was, I am. He's, it's ego a me, but he's, he's, he's taken us back to Exodus 3. He's taken us back to the Tetragrammaton, which is those four Hebrew consonants that, that are brought up. And this is, this is God's name, a name that Jews had a, they didn't say the name. A lot of that's through the influence of the Pharisees and all of this, but they wouldn't even say this name. And here's Jesus taking this name that was unique as a designation of the God of Israel, right? And frankly, of the universe. And he takes that name and then he applies it to himself. And we know, we know what they were thinking by what they did. At that very moment, they picked up rocks to stone him. Two chapters later, they pick up stones again. This is in John chapter 10. 
and they pick up stones because Jesus in verse 30, we have it recorded for us, he made a statement along these lines. I and the Father are one. And in verse 33, you know, Jesus says, are you going to stone me for the good works that I've done? This is what they said. They said, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. They understood what he was saying. He did jaw, this is jaw-dropping claims, guy. This a human being, right? They're looking at him. It's like, you obviously have flesh and, and you have bone and you have eyeballs and hair. And you are telling me that you are God? John 10, 36, it seems to be more of a report, but Jesus does seem to admit there that he had been claiming to be, and I quote, the son of God. That does not refer to some sort of biological relationship. He might as well have said something like, I am the same as God, or I am equal to God. The Jews understood his claim to deity. I don't know if you've seen this lately or recall this, but in John 19, 7, speaking to Pilate about why Jesus should be put to death, the Jewish leaders insisted. Here's what they said. We have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. They got what he was trying to claim. And all of these things that he said, they saw what he was claiming and they wanted to kill him for it. So here's what you got to see. Yes, Jesus taught on morality. He taught on ethics. No question about that. But the same guy who told us, for instance, what our relationship to money should look like is the same person who claim to be God. What's the significance of that? I have yet to find probably a, a better quote on this very matter than C.S. Lewis. This is at the end of chapter three in his book, Mere Christianity. I don't know if you can see that well. There's his, there's his face. If you're like, I've never seen his face before. Well, you're welcome, right? So here's what, here's what C.S. Lewis says. I don't think anybody's ever improved on this. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say, Lewis writes. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else he is a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Isn't that great? This is, of course, the famous, is he a liar, is he a lunatic, or is it, this is the, this is the birth, this is the origin of that. But he's, this is what he's getting after. The, all these people, even back in Lewis's day, oh, Jesus of Nazareth, um, oh, great, great God. I'm glad he existed. You know, he gave us some good stuff. Oh, he's more than that. You know, if a person concludes that Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be, then he must be prepared to argue that Jesus was either raving mad or the biggest con artist in human history. It would be impossible for Jesus to be a great moral teacher if he was either profoundly confused about his own identity 
or he was lying to people about who he was. Here's another thing people say about Jesus today. He was some cult leader who was just trying to uh, build his own power base and overthrow the powers that be. Isn't this interesting? Um, this was essentially what the Jewish leaders were trying to get Pilate to believe about Jesus. Am I right? Three times, three times in John's gospel, Pilate says, I find no guilt in this man. This man is innocent. And then the Jewish leaders drop this bomb on Pilate. If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. If you go back and you kind of read um, what we know about Pilate, his, he was on some shaky ground with the emperor. This right here scared Pilate. I don't even know if Pilate believed this, but it scared him. And so that's when we go to Gabbatha, the stone pavement, and we get the sentence. And then from Gabbatha, we go to Golgotha. And Jesus is crucified. And it's all under this ruse that he was this power hungry leader that was looking, you know, to create an insurrection and overthrow the Roman Empire. Now, that might have been what the Jews wanted, frankly. Isn't that ironic? Let's kill this guy for doing what, frankly, we wish we could get someone to do. We ever thought about that, <laughs> right? But that's, this is where we're at. John 6, you know what they try to do there? That big crowd? Let's make him king, right? Let's force him. Did Jesus say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea? No, he withdrew himself. And then here's that story, right? Peter he unsheathes his sword. He's ready to fight. He's ready. What, is, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, you got to put that back. That, that, that action right there does not fit a man who is looking to build his power base and overthrow the powers that be. I mean, you are working against yourself at that point if you're telling your people not to fight. And he said as much to Pilate. And he's like, if my kingdom were of this world, do you not know? Do you not know they'd be fighting for that right now? Here's another thing. And let me warn you, this last one is going to hurt a little bit. It's going gonna, it's gonna to offend you, perhaps. But there's a lot of people that just dismissively say of Jesus... He was just some religious leader that got killed 2,000 years ago. And it's true that Jesus was a leader and that Jesus was executed 2,000 years ago. But I would dare say that you and I would admit that that does not exhaust the significance of what happened 2,000 years ago. Those of us who are Christians, we are convinced that Jesus didn't just die in Barabbas' place 2,000 years ago. We firmly convicted that he died in our place. I love Galatians 2.20 for this fact that Paul makes Jesus' death that voluntary, vicarious giving of his life, he makes it personal and says that Jesus is the one who gave himself for me. I gotta make this personal. Paul did. He gave himself for us, collectively speaking, yes. But he also gave himself for each one of us individually. If Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be, 
then his perceived sacrifice on humanity's behalf would have been a farce. But thankfully, God validated everything. Everything Jesus did, everything Jesus said when he was raised from the dead. Very quickly, I'll bring these three up. What are some just some practical things here. One, you, we, we have to believe in Jesus for who he is. He said, Jesus said, I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's a bold claim. Jesus ties salvation from our sins to believing in his true identity. He does. You can't separate this. You want to be saved? You need to recognize who Jesus is. You got you to believe who he is. A lot of people would laugh at us for this. But Jesus puts it out here. If a person misidentifies him, then that person will not believe in him for who he is. And he or she will die in their sins. A second thing, confession, right? Jesus proclaimed in Matthew's gospel, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Think about John's gospel. This is a really interesting sort of theme we see in the gospel. You remember the blind man's parents in John 9? They had an opportunity to essentially confess Jesus. And they didn't do it. Why? Because they were afraid they'd get put out of the synagogue. For fear of the Jews, they didn't say a word. They, they go, ask, ask our son. He's of age. What about, what about the authorities, the religious leaders in John 12? The text tells us, getting towards the end of John 12, that many of the authorities believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. They didn't go public with it. They, they kept it to themselves. What about Joseph of Arimathea? What does the text say about him? For fear of the Jews, he was a secret disciple. He, he believed. I mean, he recognized Jesus for who he was. But, but it's got to go further than that. There's got to be a what? People got to know that I'm with him. And that I acknowledge him for who he is. There's a place for that. And then finally, obeying Jesus. I love this. Remember on the, on the hills of the transfiguration, what happens? We hear God's voice. God starts with a statement of identity about his son. What does he say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, I think we understand that listening to him involves what? Not just hearing him, but actually doing what he says. The end of the Sermon on the Mount, I, I like illustrating this. We sing a song with our kids from time to time about the wise man building his house on a rock and, and the foolish man building his house on the sand. Have you noticed that that song doesn't really tell us what separates the, the wise man from the foolish man? It doesn't. Go, go through the song in your head right now. We're building, you know, on the rock and we're building on the sand, but we don't really... We don't really communicate in that song what separates the sand man from the rock man. The rock man is the person who hears what Jesus says and then does what Jesus says. The sand man is the one who hears what Jesus says but doesn't do what Jesus says. All authority. Not just some authority was given to Jesus because of who he was and what he accomplished. 
And him having authority means he is to be my king and my Lord. When Jesus was crucified, Pilate had an inscription placed on the cross that read, are you ready? Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. I want you to imagine, I'll tell you what, let's all imagine, all of us, that, that we were there that day. Pilate gathers us together and says, hey, I want you to, I want you to put a sign up about who you think Jesus of Nazareth is. I'm going to let you make the sign. I'm going to let you put on that sign what you want to say about him. What are we going to put on the sign? First thing I might do is, it's true, he's the king of the Jews in a sense. Yeah, I'd, like, I'd probably knock the of the Jews off and put up, um, of kings. Maybe we got king of kings up there, right? Maybe one of you wants to put, your, maybe some of us, you know, come up with some of the things, uh, maybe light. Like he's, he's light. Maybe one of you wants to put hope up there. I love how Jesus doesn't say, hey, I will resurrect you or something like that. He says what? I am the resurrection. He had a way of doing that, right? Maybe, maybe one of you wants to put up there a, like this, a breath of fresh air. Because that's who he is. Maybe one of you wants, like, Jesus, you are clarity. You are clarity. You clarify the important things in life. Maybe one of you is like, he is the high priest par excellence. At this point, the sign's getting pretty big, right? We're going to need a lot more than just that little titulus there. Maybe one of you wants to put master teacher. You're, you're amazed at his teaching the way he teaches, how he teaches. And you're like, that, that's, that's him. I want to put that there. Maybe somebody wants to put warrior. He was a warrior. I mean, he waylaid and manhandled Satan and his minions. And as, as uh, Will did so good today with the raising of Lazarus, he pummeled, absolutely pummeled death. Maybe somebody's going to put something a little enigmatic, maybe watershed. You know what a watershed is. The rain comes down. It's got to go one way or the other. And isn't it, isn't it in fact the case from our perspective that Jesus kind of became the watershed moment in history? We got B.C. and we got A.D. Maybe somebody wants to highlight the fact that he is, he's the lamb, or the Savior, or something like that, where we're, we're acknowledging something. You know, I realize, our, I realize this is really using our imagination, but maybe we're, we're like, this, this, what's happening here is not just, again, for Barabbas, it's for all of us. And we, wanna, we want people to know that he's the Savior. And I'll tell you what I'd be okay with. I'd be perfectly okay with this. If you were to walk up to that side and just erase everything we've written and put one word on it, everything. He is everything. Right? Thank you.